Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Episode 2478 of The Tom Woods Show. Who knows what I'm trying to prove at this point. But delighted to be joined for the first time ever by the great Alex Stein of Primetime with Alex Stein on The Blaze, where you can also find our our dear friend Eric July and other fine people, Matt Kibbe. But Alex Stein is the man of the hour today. Uh, Alex, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure, Tom. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. All right, look, you and I have completely different styles. I mean, maybe we have a lot of the same views, but we have completely different styles. If, but although I love the fact that you're actually better dressed than I am on this. So kind of undermines me. I'm a pimp on a blimp, Tom. What are you talking <laughs> about? When I go on these shows, I have to dress nice. But see, that's the thing is when when you're me, because I'm really very edgy, very wild, very impromptu, I have to put on the suit and tie because it, it's what keeps you from getting arrested. You can, <laughs> if you put on a suit and tie, you can basically do anything. I mean, I, literally. It's incredible the, the respect you get just by being well-dressed. No, seriously, you, I walk into a McDonald's, they treat me nice. I walk in anywhere in a freaking tie, and you get this respect. And I think the cops do, too, especially when I go to these city council meetings. Because I'm not dressed, you know, in, like, full head-to-toe Palestinian gear, they're probably not going to arrest me. They think I'm an attorney or something like that. Yeah, so that's, feel a, like the, that's the, the, see, the drawback to this is that, let's say you're walking around dressed like this in J.C. Penney. Everybody assumes you work there. Yes. I, yeah, I don't work at J.C. Penney. Not this yeah, they do ask me for help at the mall. Yes, <laughs> do you work here? Yes, that happens. But yeah, it's worth it. The fake respect that it commands, and and it's so simple. Like you know, Gavin McInnes is a guy I like a lot, and Gavin always dresses nice. I would see him, even though I'm dressed nice for forever. He acts absolutely insane, but he dresses kind of nice, and it you know it, it levels him up a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. I dress a little bit nice because I'm a nerd. Is that not because I have anything to? <laughs> yeah, you're definitely a nerd. You've written all these books. You know, you're a libertarian nerd. Tom. Yeah. I wish I was a nerd. Instead, I, I went to LSU in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I basically majored in like vodka and tailgating <laughs> and just the most degenerate lifestyle. But I did graduate. But gosh, I look back at my college with a lot of I wish I would have applied myself a little more. Well, you know, on the other hand, uh, I'm going to. I'm going to let you in on a little secret here, uh, Alex. The nerds secretly wished they were Alex Stein. I'm just letting mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> I don't know about that. They don't want this stress. I got I got cats. I got toxoplasmosis, Tom. And the thing is, is at least you have a brain. You can write about it. I'm famous because I called AOC a big booty Latina. So I'm still chasing that dream. I don't know if you know this, but Tom, I sued AOC because she blocked me on Twitter. And now the Supreme Court ruled that uh, politicians are not supposed to legally be able to block their constituents, and she still won't unblock me. Oh, so uh, yes, AOC Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. It's insane that there is drama between her and I. All right, let's go back. I mean, you're a young-ish guy. Let's say, at least compared mm -hmm. to me, uh, who or what like woke you up politically to the point where you became who you are now? Well, I mean, let, let's just be real. For me, it was Alex Jones. I know that you're like, what do you mean? I mean, I was just for for me. You're a libertarian. I consider myself a lot of libertarian viewpoints. Obviously, I have some conservative viewpoints, but I have a, some. I believe in social services. I would like uh, medical caps. If we had universal health care, I think that could benefit our society. So, you know, that's a very liberal policy. I don't know how it would work in theory, but my point is the reason why I liked Alex Jones is because I felt like he was kind of like politically homeless. He was just going against both sides because I liked it when he was speaking out against George Bush. And I grew up in Texas, a conservative place. And I'm like, George Bush, you know? Once you find out a lot about the war for weapons of mass destruction that did not exist, and once you really look into, for me, Tom, you're probably a respectful you know, person, but I, I have no doubt in my mind that America had prior knowledge to the terror attacks on 9-11. And, and if you don't have to be a conspiracy theorist to know this, that George Bush and Condoleezza Rice both officially state that they were warned that there was a plan to fly buildings, excuse me, flying planes into buildings but they didn't take the threat seriously. Me, the conspiracy theorist, that's the official story. I believe they got that warning and they said, hey, we're not going to do anything because this will benefit us because there's a thing called the Project for a New American Century. They basically laid out, um, you know, some of the biggest threats in the Middle East that we potentially were going to go to war with. So, I, I mean, politically, I'm like, oh, there's a deep state that run the country and both sides are crooked personally, Tom. But Alex Jones is what kind of woke me up 
all of a sudden I'm like, well, this is, this is not what they're telling us. Isn't it interesting that it's, I wouldn't say Alex Jones, like in the minds of the average American has been vindicated, but you could definitely say that his respectability level has increased dramatically over the past year or two, and yet he hasn't done anything any differently. Well, you know, Alex Jones had a similar thing, and not to his level, but Donald Trump, before 2016, was beloved by Howard Stern, by every rapper. And as soon as he became political, you know, they all hated him. That was similar to Alex Jones. Alex Jones was loved. He did a press tour. He went on Piers Morgan's. He went on Howard Stern. They all loved him before um, the Sandy Hook deal. So I guess my point is he's been vindicated. He's been right about some stuff. He's been wrong about some stuff. But if you look at CNN's, you know, well, what is, what is their batting average? Like 0%. So, I mean, Alex Jones is batting way better than those guys are. And, um, you know, we speculate stuff. I'm sure you speculate things. I speculate what's going on in the Gaza Strip. I speculate what's going on in Ukraine. I don't know this. I say stuff. But I, like I said, I think Alex Jones is more right than he is wrong. So, yeah, he has been vindicated a little. I guess I found out about you because I saw one of your videos. And I bet you hear that all the time, right? Right. That's yeah, of the, course. In fact, if you if I Google your name, one of the d job descriptions they have, or one of the identifiers is YouTuber. So, yeah. so, so you're you're on there. You've apparently have you have you ever had a a, a video taken down or a strike or oh, anything on the channel? Are you kidding, Dom? I've had to. I started off. Let me tell you my quick story. Went to LSU, moved to LA, worked as an extra for Central Casting on a bunch of stuff. Then got some production jobs. Then got casted on a reality show. Then I got real jaded from California. I moved back to Dallas. I started working for this TV show called Cheaters. We catch people cheating on their husbands and wives. And uh, it was a great show. I worked there for a long time. Started off as a PA. Became, uh, you know, a producer on the show. The host died. A guy by the name of Clark Gable died of a drug overdose. He was a good friend of mine. He was the host at the time after Joey Greco. This is a legendary show. It's been on uh, not over 20 seasons. They said, Alex, you're going to be the next host of Cheaters. I was like really sad about my friend dying, but I was so excited to do this new project. I was going to be the host. I was going to make a little more money. I was going to be the face of the show. I thought it was this big opportunity. Then when it came time to hire me, they hired this guy named Peter Guns out of New York, who is a well-known rapper. He has like a couple hit songs, but it was a affirmative action pick also because they made him change his name to Peter Panky because Viacom, which you know distributes the show on MTV, VH1, and CMT, they did not want to glamorize gun violence. So I know that they ended up picking, you know, uh, basically an African-American because that appealed to the audience. Well, I don't blame them for that. But at the time, I was heartbroken. And I just started. I decided to start my own podcast. And when I started my own podcast, I was like, what the hell am I going to talk about, Tom? Like, I'm sure you felt the same way. Everybody thinks, oh, I can start a podcast. I can click record. Well, obviously, I told you I like Alex Jones. I always like conspiracies. So I should, my first podcast, right when the pandemic was starting, was called the Conspiracy Castle. So the whole time, and it was very, it was pretty successful starting out because everybody was looking into conspiracy stuff. But that was a lot of trials and tribulations, constantly getting medical misinformation strikes, constantly doing this. And that podcast is what encouraged me to start speaking at public city council meetings and you yeah. know, yelling at politicians. So all because of that, because of my podcast, because of the strikes, because trying to reinvent myself. And I had the reason why I bring up the strikes is because I couldn't go there and say, the vaccine's causing, you know, blah, 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 or this and that. I had to go there because of terms of service and lampoon it and say, I love the vaccine. Dr. Fauci, give me that out to you. A perfect example was on YouTube, they said that it was okay to call for violence against Russia. It's not okay to call for violence against Ukraine, but it was okay. It was not against terms of service to, to violate, did not violate terms of service to make fun of Vladimir Putin or Russia. So I went to a city council meeting at Plano, Texas. I said, go insane for the Ukraine, put a bullet in Putin's brain. And it went like quadruple viral. So because of the censorship, I've had to be creative. And that's been some of my most successful stuff because of it. Are you, in, in terms of making these videos, are you just a one man show? Or like, is, do you have a team of people or are you just coming up with these ideas and executing them? Well, I started off one, one man only. I mean, that's how everybody starts off, right? You know, you had to film it, edit it. And I had like a little editing background, but I, I wasn't, I'm not a great editor, but I could do it. So I'd shoot it, film it, come up with the ideas myself. Uh, but now I work at The Blaze and I have a guy named Jimmy and Brandon, producers of my show, that they help me. But still, I mean, I'm not trying to like take all the credit, but yes, most of what I do is by myself because when you go to these meetings, you go to these protests, 
it's hard to bring a big crew. So a lot of what I do, I almost have to be like yeah. so low because it makes it easier to do what I do. So give people example, like examples of, let's say, your favorite. Because if I look at, I'm sorry, but I mean, my Wikipedia is completely stupid and, and highlights yeah, all the wrong Wikipedia things. Yeah, my Wikipedia is written by crazy people that hate my guts. Yeah, but me it's, too. No, it's, yeah, it's Me weird. Too. You, you would read mine and say, "I this sounds like nothing like the guy I actually know. So I always recommend people just read the bio at tomwoods.com. That's where you'll yeah. actually learn about me. But I, but I, but there is some some funny stuff here. So I, I, I do want to say, so D Magazine described Stein's city council pranks as, quote, mostly harmless, if at times in poor taste, unquote, and said that publicity from the videos had gained Stein access to, this is my favorite part, quote, larger right-wing platforms where he can spread misinformation, transphobia, and conspiracy theories, unquote. So I want to get to that in a minute. But for people who are unfamiliar with you, what would be one or two of your favorite uh, videos of you at one of these local government meetings? Well, my my personal favorite one is the one where I went to Dallas and I said, Dr. Fauci, give me that ouchie, and I just freestyle rapped, because that's the one that everybody shared. It kind of put me I still wasn't, you know, you have one viral video. Not everybody knows who you are, right? But that's like, that's the first video that I was like, holy crap. You know, I've had videos get some views, but it was the first one I was like, it kind of made me addicted to it a little bit. I'm like, wow, this is what it's like to go viral, quote unquote. And then uh, that one was my favorite. And then my favorite video, if, if it's not city council, has to be when I called AOC a big booty Latina because it was very harmless. She came up to me. She gave me a peace sign. She was not mad. But then when she found out who I was, she just went on Instagram and made 16 stories about how much she hated me, this and that. I mean, she really villainized me. But to the right, I became a hero, you know, because the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So it was just it, that one was the one that really kind of put me on the on the map. Well, I'm not trying to get you not in trouble with your employer. Obviously, the Blaze knew what it was getting into when it brought Alex Stein on, but but I have to say I'm a little surprised because um, even though I think Glenn Beck is a pretty open-minded guy and he's been willing to change his opinion on things over the years, I, I still feel like the blaze has maybe like a, a half a foot in the establishment. I mean, if, even if it's just a half a foot in terms of, re of respectability, and yet he's letting you get away with well, as Wikipedia says, spreading misinformation and conspiracy theories. Well, I do spread misinformation and conspiracy theories because a lot of what I do is I astroturf as like, you know, these crazy leftists. So, yeah, I mean, so, you know, with me, it's hard to know what's real or fake. And, and Glenn, you know, I was obviously at the top of the company, but there's executives that really run the company. And uh, some of the executives, they want to uh, create content that's a little edgier. You know, it's funny that you would say that the Blaze is, you know, I think everybody wants to be a little establishment, right? When you own a media company, you know, obviously I think we're anti-establishment, but of course we want the respect, you know, of... Well, like I mean, it's not it's not InfoWars. That's what I mean. Like, it's still oh, yeah, on the, sure, the big for platforms. Sure. We're, we're not as edgy as InfoWars, but at the same time, you know, Blaze is a... They're, they're trailblazing. They're trying to do comedy, and really, that's what I am. I'm a comedian. I'm not a serious journalist. I mean, I can cover stuff. I can bring attention to stuff, but I'm not out here trying to be like, oh, well, you know, this is the migrant crisis. Everybody knows the migrant crisis is terrible. I'm trying to make fun of it. So I'm trying to, I guess, bring attention to, to you know, serious subjects in a, you know, a humorous way. So I guess that's kind of why I'm different. You know, if I was trying to be serious and the way, and I acted the way I do, you know, like, I don't think that would work out. But because the Blaze has a sense of humor and they want to create more comedic content, that content, that's why they have Normal World with Dave Landau you know, Agua Donkeys, they're investing in, you know, miniseries and movies. So, you know, it's not just a, a, a political news uh, media company. Hey, everybody, let's take a minute to thank our sponsor, Persist SEO. If you are getting buried by your competition online, then build your brand, your reputation, and your lead flow with digital marketing by Persist SEO. If you are a small local business trying to compete against large companies in the service industry, then increase your visibility with Persist SEO? Or what if you have low or no leads coming in on a consistent basis? Well, then website search engine and conversion optimization can help move the needle to a more prosperous business model for you. Are you tired of cold calling and networking, meeting places getting shut down? Use your website as a lead generation engine. Or what if you're not showing up for your services in the search engines? Well, get found with Persist SEO's expert search engine optimization. 
All you have to do is call 770-580-3736 or visit them at ineedseo.help for a free website audit and consultation. That's 770-580-3736 or ineedseo.help. You've had such an eventful life. I mean, uh, you know, with, with the reality TV and, and, and uh, you know, be, being in different industries and then all of a sudden going completely viral with the, the videos you make and then getting your own show. I mean, does it surprise even you? No, not at all. What are you talking about, dude? I've had to grind my whole life. I had to start off as an extra. I've been on The Office. I've been working in television and media since college. I know it's unsurprising. It always surprised me that I didn't get well-known earlier. That America and the world's been crapping on me this long, and now they gave me a shot. And that's the thing, though, Tom, is, is, is you know, now that I make it, everybody thinks, oh, like I've done so much. I got so much crap to do. I, I'm, I mean, I guess I got a podcast on the boys. They pay me okay, but still, it's like, you know, that's, that can only last so long if it's not successful. Like everybody thinks that you've made it, right? Because you have a Wikipedia and you're just, yeah. you know, you got a little money in your pocket. No, like I'm constantly trying to reinvent the wheel and constantly putting pressure on myself. Really, I'm putting more pressure on myself now that I'm well known than I was when I was a nobody. When I was a nobody, I had no pressure, right? I didn't have to perform. Everything was gravy. Now it's like I've done stuff. You have to stay relevant. So it's actually more pressure being well known. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of, well, I mean, <laughs> it's a bad example, but, and, and it's uh, probably a little bit before your time. But in the 1970s, the Bee Gees were on top of the world. I mean, absolute domination of the radio stations. And then the public just turned on them, just yeah. like that, burning their records at, well, I don't know if it was Shea Stadium or whatever. I mean, they had these anti disco nights and, and, and the, the Bee Gees were like, oh, overnight, they just, Barry Gibb had to res resort to writing songs for other people. He didn't know what, what to do. Well, why is that? Why did, why did these people stop liking disco music? Why do you think they stopped liking them so fast? I think it was a backlash against just how dominant they were. Like, they were just everywhere you turn. You can become a victim of your own success. No, yeah. you really can't. But, but you know what I've noticed, Tom, that where I get a lot of hate from, because I speak at a lot of colleges and stuff, and I've been protested, but I don't get protested as much um, lately. But a lot of the, like, ultra conservatives, you know, the ultra uh, evangelical Christian conservatives, those people get mad at me the most with my content. And it's really kind of scary because they create campaigns to get you canceled. You know, the right has cancel culture just like the left. Both sides have cancel culture. So, that's what I'm, I'm almost more worried about getting canceled from the right than I am from the left. Isn't that funny that how different right and left are, that the left will, doesn't care at all. The left will do what it takes to, to get what it wants, mm -hmm. whereas so much of the right wants to make sure that you're following the rules and you're behaving a certain way. And well, which side do you think is going to win if, if one side is tying, you know, one and a half hands behind its back? Well, and it's a lot of fake virtue signaling on the right. A lot of these people on the right that'll tell you that they're the biggest Christian, this and that. You know, they're. I've met a lot of politicians. I haven't met a politician yet, and I'm friends with some. You know, some of them are morally, you know, upstanding, but they're just like you and me. They're corruptible. They're not. I guess my point is a lot of people put on this facade, and for very few people, I think they're actually uh, talking the talk and walking the walk. A lot of people are talking the talk, but not everybody's walking the walk in my personal experience, what I've noticed. Yeah, well, there's there's a lot of that. And, and I would say in this trad movement on the right, um, you know, I think some of them are not being sincere, but we'll just, we'll just leave of it. Of course not. Of <laughs> course not. And that's fine, I guess. I mean, but that that's why I like to, I guess the best content that I, or the most successful content is when you call out hypocrisy. So I guess there's hypocrisy on both sides is what I try to call out. Because, you know, I've gotten in arguments with Dan Crenshaw, I, Patch McCain, I, that guy and I d despise each other. I mean, I'm anti-war. I hate what's going on in the Middle East. I hate what's going on in the Ukraine. And guys like Dan Crenshaw are quote-unquote conservative, but he, he wants to send your kid to die. He wants to make money for Boeing, Halliburton, Raytheon. He doesn't care about putting money in your and I's pocket or the middle, of, you know, the middle class of America's gone. There's no middle class. There's no young men that can barely... Anybody can afford to buy a house unless you're like in real estate, unless you, you know, are an engineer, you are a lawyer. Most people aren't that and don't have that ability to become that. And you can't even afford to buy a house. And it's, it's really kind of sad that these politicians want to just spend all this money on helping out corporations when they're not helping out people. 
Well, who are a handful of people in public life who you would say are on the up and up and they aren't involved in anything nefarious and they genuinely are trying to do their best? Do you have any? Well, I mean, maybe Thomas Massey. I don't know him that well, but I mean, he seems like a guy. The Pauls, they seem like they're pretty upstanding. Um, uh, you know, I'm friends with some I don't want to name, but I mean, I, yeah. when you're friends <laughs> with them, you kind of hear some stuff about them. You're kind of like, oh, okay, well, you're not you're not a Boy Scout or a Girl, Scra- Girl Scout. Um, but, you know, politicians, idolizing a politician or celebrity is like thinking the stripper actually likes you. It, it's, you know, it's a facade. I mean, yeah. they're all... They're all corruptible. I'm not saying that they're all corrupt, but um, dude, let's just, if you're in DC and you're dependent on your donors, a person that donates you a lot of money is going to have a lot of influence over you. Like, they, uh, you know, it's this, it's as hard. So it, it's, you can go up to Washington, DC, you can go into the Texas legislature with the best intentions. But as soon as you get there, you realize, oh, I need money from these people. And then what do they give me money for? Influence. You're corrupted. So yeah, I don't I don't know. Politicians, I don't trust any of them. And I love Donald Trump, but even Donald Trump's not perfect. Nobody's perfect, you know, when you become that powerful. Okay, so we've been talking about the course of your life and how, you know, nobody handed you a damn thing and you you got here and but now that you got here, now you have now the bigger problem is staying, you know, or yes. or, or or growing. And and the, the issue is that today, I mean, could you imagine comparing uh let's say your entertainment or news options in 1950 mm-hmm. to today. I mean, you had like three channels and two newspapers you could read. And now just television alone, the choices you have are through the roof. You have every movie ever made at your disposal. Every book you could ever want to read is sitting right there. And so you have to think the competition for people's attention has never been more intense. So I have to think all the time, why the hell would people want to listen to the Tom Woods show? I better make it worth their while. Yeah, but you know this, Tom, you've been doing this longer than me. And this is a secret for all the people that are watching this and feel like they're in an oversaturated market, which it is. You only need about 500 to 1,000 loyal fans to survive. If you want to be a content creator or podcaster, you need about 1,000 loyal fans. That'll give you five bucks to 10 bucks. If you can get them to give you 10 bucks, if they love you, you get 1,000 people. That's $10,000 a month. I'm not saying it's just an easy process. But it's possible if you actually put in the work and you actually build a community. So what seems like an impossibility, creating content and making a living doing it, is actually possible. And you don't have to be the biggest streamer like Hassan Piker or, you know, whoever the hell, you know, you think of PewDiePie or, you know, Mr. Beast to make it on the Internet. Of course, it's a grind. There's no guarantees. But uh, I would encourage anybody, even in an oversaturated market, if you talk about what you're passionate about, you could probably find an audience. Let's talk about a difference between you and me, where I think now we no longer have that difference, but for a long time we did. And that is, it used to really bother me when total strangers, who I shouldn't care about at all, would say bad things about me or call me names or imply that I'm a bad person. And I I used to, like 20 years ago, I would want to go around to every blog that mentioned me and explain to them that they've got me all wrong. And this does this in fact, instead, you have the opposite and this seems to power you. So how, how do you get to be somebody like that who just lets it all just roll right off? Well, you know, it, it's, it's, it's funny you say that Tom, because I would love, like you mentioned a guy, Eric July, I respect the hell out of Eric July. When the people talk crap about him, he puts him on blast. You know, you don't make any money. You don't live in your mom's basement. I have the opposite approach is I, have to ignore it but I, it, it does you know affect me a little bit you know some people you know talk a little smack and i hear it i hear it but for me i can't get in the woods because then that's i'm all about and i i'm not perfect but i'm all about vibrational energy i'm all about high vibrational energy when i see the the comments and negative comments it's very low vibrational that puts me in a state of like you know fight or fly where i'm just you know kind of reactionary i like to be high vibrational so where i can just you know I guess be more patient and, and less bothered. So really, I don't read a lot of the negative comments and I just ignore it. I mean, I constantly, I just, that's the only thing I can't engage with it. So I don't know, did you, you said that you used to engage with it? Yeah. I've never really engaged with that. I always just, oh, you want to talk crap? Muted, blocked, or I don't just, just ignore it. I just, that's the only way um, 
that I think that uh, I can effectively deal with the hate that I get. Well, I was talking, I better not say his name, but I'm sh- it's somebody I'm sure you know. And I was telling him about, I, I had, because the, the, you know, I, I go through waves of abuse. You know, there's a wave and then they, it subsides and there's another wave. And I was in the middle of a wave and it was irritating me. And so I was talking to somebody who's taken a lot of abuse from people. I said, how do you deal with it? And he said, I just block them. And I said, yeah, yeah. but if I block them, then they're going to run a victory lap saying, oh, hey, Woods blocked me. And he says, who, who cares? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I like the- when they run the victory lap. Do you not realize that? Like, obviously, I'm creating content because I want attention. I just don't want to hear your negative vibrational stuff because when you do hear the comments, the negative, it kind of makes you feel, I mean, I don't let it get to me that much where you're like, oh, Alex Ryan's an unfunny piece of crap. You know, you're like, okay, I don't want to read this about myself. This is not so, you right. know, just block it. Yeah, they post a thing blogging about you. Think about it, you're such a loser that they think I'm such a big deal because I block their yeah, ass. Right. Like they, I mean, that's how, what he well, said. Don't look at the mirror. I've been blocked by a lot of people. AOC, the reason I brag about it, because AOC is the third most popular pop, pop, uh, a politician in the world. Of course, I'm trying to clout chase AOC. But when you're cl- using me or clout chase, like, I got blocked by Alex Ryan. You're a loser. That's, that's, I mean, this is how it is. Okay. I mean, nobody cares. You got blocked by me except for you. And if you care that much to post about it, go ahead. I, I, I'll use the publicity. Yeah. Well, this, this guy was saying, look, if, if somebody is such a loser that he, he wants to post that it's, it's interesting that he was blocked by you, then get, let him have that stupid victory. Give it to him. I agree. You no, know, people post it all the time. I'm like, okay, yeah. I mean, you got blocked on me. Good. I mean, like I said, who gives a crap? You know, people are going to be like, oh, you're anti free speech because you blocked somebody. No. No. This person should be able to go and speak, you know, at a city council meeting or online and say whatever he wants. I just don't have to hear it. I don't have to listen to his ass. That's right. It's it. exactly I mean, like he doesn't have the right to come to my house and harangue me. So he's yeah. not going to do it to me, to me here. Well, this person I was talking to has blocked. I don't know how he counted it. I'm sure there's a way to find out, but 22,000 people on Twitter. And he says, it's so peaceful around here now. It's so peaceful. Mine's peaceful. Mine gets peaceful. Sometimes, like you say, it comes in waves. You know, something will pop off and you'll get some negative publicity. And then you get some positive publicity. But, through, but and then I mean this, I do mean this. I'm not saying this to sound like I'm like so virtuous, but I don't let the negative attention get me down too much. And I don't let the positive attention get me too jacked up. You know, even when I'm getting positive attention, I'm kind of like, all right, thank you. I appreciate it. Maybe that's a bad thing. Maybe I don't enjoy the good publicity enough, but I try to just kind of almost stay the same uh, level of excitedness for good news and bad news. Yeah, boy, that is, you know, that we need more stoicism. Uh, in, yeah, in and the I'm world. not stoic, but I, I do feel like that when something good's happening, I'm more relieved than I am like, all right, let's pump it up. I'm like, okay, good. Now the ship is going. Let's just, you know, let's just keep it steady. Well, let me run something by you. 20 years ago, I mean, literally 20 years ago this year, I had my first really successful book come out. It was The Politically Incorrect Guide to American History. And as you can imagine, the New York Times did not like this book. It made the bestseller list on their, they had to print it every damn week for 12 weeks. They didn't like that. But there was a signed editorial on the editorial page about how dangerous this book is and you can't read it. And then the Boston Globe did the same thing or they had an op-ed. Uh, what would they say was the worst part of it? Like when they described it, well, how would they describe it? Oh, I mean, well, they would they... Say, well, generally what they would say is he says X, Y, and Z, but they never try to disprove anything I said. It okay. was just enough for people to know that I had said it. I mean, would they use Nazi or, I mean, politically incorrect? Well, they like, didn't. You know, thankfully, they did, they, it, we hadn't quite gotten to that level yet, but it was, a mem- it was somebody from the Southern Poverty Law Center who wrote the signed piece. So yeah, like I'm they sure. were taking this seriously. And it was generally stuff like, you know, sometimes it would be nerdy stuff. Like he doesn't think the Marshall Plan helped the European economies. That's kind of a you know, nerdy one. But the others would be, he doesn't think the 14th Amendment was constitutionally ratified. It was not. I mean, we deal with it. We live with it. We, we act like it was. But you can demonstrably prove that that's the case. But instead of, instead of trying to disprove me, it was just, well, look, he said this. And we all know that all right thinking people think the other thing. It was that kind of thing. It was, I, I said all the wrong things. Well, the next week I sold more books than I ever had. So what I want to know is though, at that time, I, how old would I have been? 32. And I, I, was, I was terrified. I thought my career was, can you believe how dumb I was? I thought like my career is over. I, you know, I, I don't have any respectability if all these big papers are coming at me. And obviously the correct answer is, this is a boon for me. Because people who dislike me, by tomorrow morning, they've forgotten who I even am. 
But people who suddenly realize, hey, this guy must be doing something pretty good if the New York Times tells me don't read his book, they're going to remember me forever. So what I want to know is, if, if you were in my shoes at that time, how would you have handled that? Well, I mean, that would have been good publicity if the New York Times is coming after you because they're this, you know, the, I mean, I guess they're epitome of journalism, but they suck. I mean, they're the worst. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, they, they have um, all the respect, but no credibility. So I, I feel like it, the villainization of you is, that's good. You know, that turns you into a hero. So, yeah, I mean, I guess I would have handled, if I was on the New York Best uh, Times selling list, uh, you know, what is it, 12 weeks in a row? Like you just yeah. said, I'd be on cloud nine. I don't know why you're even sweating bullets. But it is true how, like, how AOC made me into a villain, like how they made you into a villain, made you sell more books. It's weird how sometimes you think something bad. Like I said earlier, I was really devastated when I didn't get hired as the host of Cheaters. I was going to make six figures, make a lot of money, and really was the best thing ever because now I have freedom. I created something on my own that I own, that I get to be the executive producer, and I don't have to follow, you know, a script or a format. Like, I just have so much more freedom doing it my way, like Frank Sinatra said than doing it, you know, the other way, which I thought was the industry standard. My new book, Diary of a Psychosis, is out. It's the most lively, devastating baseball bat to the throat takedown of what the public health establishment did in 2020 and beyond that you can imagine. It's my first book in nine years, and you're going to love it. Check it out at diaryofcovid.com. And if you've already bought it, make sure also to visit diaryofcovid.com so you can claim your free bonuses including my free companion volume, Collateral Damage, a collection of stories from real people who suffered under the restrictions. They weren't allowed to tell their stories at the time, but every one of them told me, we just want to be heard. Check it all out at diaryofcovid.com. All right, now I'm going to ask you to do something that I probably shouldn't ask, but, you know, it, it makes... Where would be the fun if I didn't ask something somewhat provocative? So... You know, when I talk about our movement, that's a very broad thing. I mean, there are all different networks and platforms and individuals and, and think tanks and whatever. But within the confines of, of, of that, broadly considered, who would you say irritates you the most or is the most overrated or you wish they'd shut up? Is there anybody like that? You're talking about like, like influencer, like content yeah, in, creator? Yeah, the influencer type? world, the intellectual world, the, the get, me, get attention world. Is there anybody who's just an annoying POS? I mean, there's a, a, a couple I can, I can name on here, I guess, to create drama. But who do I not like? That's, that's or, well known. Or you know what? If, I don't, if you don't want to start a civil war with anybody right now, which I understand, uh, who would be people you actually look up to and say, now this person's doing it right? Well, there, gosh, you know, uh, uh, when it comes to content creating, like when I look at YouTube, even though him and I are different because I'm really anti-establishment, I guess he is too, but I look at Benny Johnson's YouTube's crushing it. He's dominating. I look at him, I'm like, gosh, he's always putting on content. That's kind of like the content level I want to be at. But uh, Sam Hyde is probably who I want to be like the most. I don't know if you're familiar with the comedian Sam Hyde. I know Hyde. the name. He's one of my favorite. He's been canceled. You know, artistically, I want to be like Sam Hyde. When it comes to like my infrastructure and content output, I want to be like Benny Johnson. And then like the the people that I don't like, I, I don't like, um, I get a, a lot of hate from like, like you, I was saying earlier from like the kind of the trad con because I'm not traditional because even though I have conservative values, I'm anti-abortion, I believe in God. But uh, sometimes like the, some of the quote unquote, even though they call me far right, some of the far right people kind of annoy me, uh, you know, uh, but other than that, you know, then the people that are like ultra self-righteous, no, uh, nobody really bugs me. And I, and I look up to uh, artistically Sam Hyde and I, I like Benny Johnson's output. Do you feel so how often do you do you do your show three times a week? How often? Three times a week. And then I travel almost every weekend. I, you know, I go speak somewhere. But I got to, I, like I said, I got to freaking start putting more content out. I need to do more vlogs. I need to do more stuff because I do a, an hour long show three nights a week. You know, I've had clips go viral from that, but it's still, it's not enough. You know, I, I mean, you're, you're putting out a daily show. That's what I really need to be doing as a daily show. Well, I used I to, I used to, but I'm, I, I shipped it to three days a week because I. But now I, you're doing three days a week. Yeah, because I didn't build wanna... it up. You did. You did five days a week for how many years? Oh yeah. Yeah. Eight or nine. Easy. Exactly. Yeah. 
That's what and I'm so, saying. So I'm saying I'm doing three days a week. It's still not enough. Like my my audience wants more. They want a Monday show. They want a Sunday show. So I am going to have to put out more more content. Is uh, it just you or do you bring on guests? I bring on guests. I bring on guests. And, and my show really started off as really crazy. And I've gotten a lot of trouble uh, because some of my antics. So now I'm not trying to dial down the show, but I'm making it a little more interviewy, a little less chaotic. Because I, I like Eric Andre, too. He's a comedic, uh, you know, uh, guy that I want to emulate a little bit. And I realize when you do an hour-long show, like, I've, I got in trouble from Patriot Takes. Some people on the right, they got mad at me the other day because I had Laura Trump on. And my producer has a baby. So he gave his baby to Laura Trump and asked for an autograph. And in I, we cut the camera frame and I grabbed a fake baby and I punted it. As a joke, like I was if I was punting his baby. And they got so mad at me because like, oh, this guy's doing a baby abuse show. They called it baby abuse show. It was a joke. And it was a WWE bit. And uh, what's funny is obviously, you know, it, it was a joke and and Laura Trump didn't even care. She was so nice. But the next day we I I issued a fake apology. And for the we do a caption contest. For the caption contest, we showed the baby, and the baby, when I kicked it, the head was dented in. And they do a caption contest, so the audience gets to pick a caption. They picked, this is Dan Crenshaw's baby, and like one of the eyes messed up. Oh, so no. Patriot takes shirt the next day. They're like, now Alex is making fun of uh, Dan Crenshaw's <laughs> baby, uh, newborn daughter. And so it's just funny how, uh, but that kind of helps you in a weird way too. So it's, uh, I, I'm creating content. But sometimes it's annoying when you go viral for the wrong thing. Well, do, do you have a website or is it just promote the show? Just go to Prime Time with Alex Stein or follow me on Twitter, Alex Stein 99. I mean, I'm all over the internet. If you can't find me, I'm on Instagram. I even have a TikTok. I don't really post on there. They're constantly kicking me off. But go watch my YouTube show. Obviously, watch it on The Blaze as well. Go to blazetv.com slash primetime if you want to join. But um, I uh, my YouTube is what I'm trying to build up because we're a year in one month done with my show. It's been 13 months. So I got it. Just, you know how it is after a year. Now we're starting to gain. But I think, and I've done it, my Conspiracy Castle podcast. It really didn't, even though I had some good episodes because I had some big guests, it really didn't start taking off until two years. It took two full years. And so that's kind of what I'm like. I'm like, you know, after this two-year mark, we really better start hitting our stride. So we've got about seven, eight, and nine months before we're really on fire, I think. What's the deal with the 99? I was my high school football number. I'm a pimp on a blimp, Highland Park High School football captain. 2005, I played with Super Bowl champion Matthew Stafford, the quarterback of the Los Angeles Rams. So uh, in Texas, high school football is a big deal, and I um, am a high school hero still living. No, I, I kind of am a high school hero a little bit living in my glory days. But 99, they always called me 99 Alex Stein, the Stein man, 99 man. So I just kind of always kept it. That's pretty good. I mean, it's it works. It rolls right off the tongue. tongue. Yeah. So. All right, so check it out, guys. Prime time with Alex Stein. I'll, I'll have uh, uh, Alex's Twitter and all the links that you want in the video description and on the show notes page, which would be tomwoods.com slash 2478. And Alex, thanks so much. Tom, thank you. Always a pleasure. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.